In this episode of Undictated, we have another look at what's going on in the nuclear side. Two very strong voices of opinion uh, that we are going to be countering against each other. We had Kevin Marlam uh, on this program last week saying that the proposed nuclear plant is nothing more than state capture mark two. Dr. Calvin Kem, chairman of Stratec Global, who has been on us, uh, with us rather, on this program in the past, uh, has got a different point of view. Well, Calvin, good to have you with us again. The last time we spoke, you opened a lot of eyes. Uh, after Kevin Milam's interview, which has also been extremely well watched by the business news community, uh, you contacted me to say, hang on a minute, this guy's not actually telling the whole truth. Um, or as they would say in the Cockney land, uh, there are a few pork pies amongst uh, what he was selling to the community. Maybe we can start at the very beginning and, and from where most of the public sit. Nuclear appears to be full of corruption. It appears to be very expensive and it appears to be uh, out of touch with what is happening in the world where the investments are being made in energy. In other words, uh, on renewables, we're seeing Moore's Law coming in where the cost of renewables are going down. I had the privilege of actually meeting um, Dr. Kimberly Boodle, who's uh, driving at the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory the whole advance is in nuclear fusion. And she was talking about in 30 years' time, energy will be free essentially. And the problem, I guess, when you look at that as uh, nuclear plants, you say, but hang on, they're expensive. They, they cost a lot of uh, the, the national um, debt. What is to stop them from becoming white elephants as technology goes forward? Now, you're much smarter at these things than I am. And I'm sure these ideas or these questions have been occupying your mind as well. Well, there's uh, a lot of error in what people believe. Bear in mind that there's been anti-nuclear propaganda, second to none, going on for a couple of decades now. And uh, the, the anti-nuclear lobby has been extremely well funded by all sorts of strange sources. They're a wealthy crowd. And as a result, they've been able to put up major campaigns and so on, whereas the nuclear people don't. They first, there's no money involved in nuclear for things like public relations. They put it all into the the technology is a failing on the part of the nuclear people, but also so many of the nuclear people are employed in companies such that they're not allowed to just go out and talk. It's got to go all the way up through their communications department and so on. So very often, any responses are killed off long before they can be effectively made. It doesn't mean that the nuclear people don't talk about this around the tea table and so on. So that's the background. Now, you mentioned corruption. Let's get corruption out of the way first. There's no indication whatsoever of any corruption in nuclear in South Africa, nothing. That's a complete red herring that has been created by the anti-nuclear lobby. There was some talk about, oh, there was this goings on between South Africa and the Russians and so on. I know nothing about that. What there was at the time is South Africa signed five agreements with five different countries for a technological platform from which to operate in nuclear dealings. They were France, China, the United States, Korea, and Russia. The last one to be signed was Russia. At the time, the minister was in Vienna and signed the agreement with Russia on the sidelines. That agreement was, do we understand that we're working on metric measure, we will be doing this, we'll be doing this. It's an absolute platform from which you can start to talk. When that came out, the Greens immediately accused South Africa of secretly signing an agreement to purchase nuclear, which wasn't true at all. One thing that did compound it was on the Russian side, they issued a press release. The press, the press release from our side came to me in English, which was perfectly understandable. The Russian one was originally created in Russian, and then some Russian young lady whom I happened to know because I'd met her before, she did a translation, and it wasn't that good. And she did it from their perspective, saying this can lead now to bigger things, which can eventually lead to us selling nuclear power to South Africa. So that's where the nuclear power sale to South Africa thing possibly came from. People took that statement and said, we have made a secret deal. I have spoken here to cabinet ministers face to face. I was chairman of Nexa during that critical period, the most senior 
official nuclear position in the country. I've spoken to numbers of people here, and they know nobody knows anything about any supposed secret deal anywhere between South Africa and Russia. I've been to Moscow more than once. I've sat with the chief executive of Rosatom, deputy cabinet ministers and people. They tell me to my face they know nothing. Um, they look as they're completely telling the truth. It didn't look like any cover-up because they're as mystified as anybody. So this story about corruption, I just don't believe it's true. Secondly, with corruption, there's no reason why nuclear lends itself to corruption more than anybody else. In fact, it's the opposite. There's much more chance of corruption in water pipelines, multiple solar projects, multiple wind projects, all that stuff. Nuclear goes through such a process of the nuclear engineers doing assessments, recommending the economics guys doing assessments, recommend this all melds together. This goes round and round and spirals and eventually comes to a recommendation to cabinet. Normally, like three companies will say that, that, and that satisfy our objectives. Our foreign affairs or somebody got other national interest things to add, it's done. It goes backwards and forwards. There's no way that ex-president Zuma could have just said, I think I'll buy a nuclear reactor from somebody. It, it just wouldn't work like that. Well, it, so sure, that's but if you, if you recall, it. sorry, Calvin. Mm. Just, no, you're just, welcome. Uh, if you recall what happened with Ntlantlanene, he was fired because he took a stand against the nuclear deal. If you have a look at it from an economics perspective, the cost of that nuclear deal would bankrupt South Africa. That I do know. We were already sitting at 80% debt to GDP ratio. That would have taken us to over well over 100%. So from a financial point of view, it was it, it was something uh, there was a, there was a lot of legitimate resistance to it. Uh, perhaps uh, some of the uh, some of that resistance is as you say was would have been funded by people who had vested interests, but there was a lot of legitimate resistance and and concern and a lot of it came out after uh, Nene was fired. Well, you, you mentioned legitimate. There are a lot of people I've come across at cocktail parties or whatever, they'd come up and attack me and say, look at the cost. And I said, but where did you get it from? Oh, they got it from some newspaper or somewhere or somewhere. And it's not at all real. South Africa did a calculation. Our scientists and engineers at 650 billion rand would buy three nuclear power stations, each larger than Kruger by 50%. And that would be over 10 to 15 years built sequentially. The anti-nuclear lobby took that total 10 to 15 year expenditure, compressed it in one year and made out that we were going to pay for this one check once, one off, which would have been problematic. People like Nanny, for example, was do his finances, but not come and make statements about nuclear that he knew nothing about because he was very wrong with much of that because he made these false assumptions. The total amount of money that we've now spent so far on wind and solar is equal to one entire nuclear power station larger than Kubro. And yet we are getting minimal out of the wind and solar. Had we built that one nuclear power station half a dozen years ago or so, it would be running now and we would have two and a half thousand megawatts uninterrupted 24 hours a day all of the time. We wouldn't have had load shedding ever had we built one nuclear power station. Now because of the decision to go into all this wind and solar, we've got it. Now, one must remember that so much of this comes out from emotion. It's not sound science. What we need is to face reality, not all the fictional stories going around. And with respect, Mr. Milam has got many things very wrong. He's not a technical person. He doesn't understand. He made a number of errors in his statement from the scientific perspective as well. And so we, we want to look at it. Now, as far as the cost is concerned, nuclear is the cheapest, safest, greenest, and most sensible energy in the world, ever, all right? It's been proven the power stations that were built in the 1970s in the United States and so on are still running, virtually all of them, very well. Bear in mind they're old now that they were designed in the 70s. Science has come a long way since then, so it's much better. Kuburg is now going into another 40 years lifetime, probably. It's producing South Africa's cheapest electricity at 40 cents. That's fact. Another fact is that of the oil crisis of 1973-74, France got such a fright that they decided not to find themselves, excuse the pun, over a barrel again. So they decided to go into nuclear in a big way back then, which they did. And France today is over 70% nuclear. And France's electricity prices are for less than half of Germany's, where Germany went into wind and solar in a big way. 
France also produces much less carbon dioxide than Germany does. And Germany's whole objective in going into the wind and solar was to reduce the carbon dioxide, which is, has not succeeded in doing. It's out burning more coal than South Africa does. So the whole objective of that has been shown to be a failure. France is right. France is now going back in um, to producing more nuclear. They also went through a phase that were scared to go ahead with nuclear because of the green anti-nuclear sentiment. I one day spoke to Emmanuel Macron face-to-face -face in Paris. I said, golly, I'm promoting French nuclear more than you are. And he said, yes, but I've got these crazy green people who one wrong word from me and they start throwing bricks through car windows in the street. So everybody was scared. Now the European Union in April, I think it was, in 2022, declared nuclear to be green from their taxonomy point of view. Therefore, it opens up pathways to green funding and so on. Quite rapidly now, Numbers of European leaders have been coming out saying, look, nuclear is the answer, because now they've got the courage to say it. They've known this for some time when the engineers do all the calculations and show them. The best thing for South Africa now is to go nuclear. And the one person, one energy minister in the world who saw this early on and has been plodding along this path actually has been Gwedi Mantashi. Right from two weeks into his term of office, he said, we got to hang in there with nuclear. And he's doggedly stayed there and said the reality is we can't move away from coal as rapidly as people say we should. I personally believe that coal will slowly give way to nuclear as a natural consequence of life, which nuclear is much better. Just like horse-drawn transport in the year 1900 or so slowly gave way to motor cars as people realized that motor cars really were a better bet. So those are the realities, you see. Okay. Uh, and, and that's great. They're just two issues here. The one is that South Africa appears to be the next great oil and gas province in the world. Now, how many oil and gas producers are also nuclear, are also reliant on nuclear for power? Is there a, is there a trade-off between one or, or the other? No, like the, you know, the oil and gas, South Africa has hunted for oil for decades and decades. We seem to be on the verge of coming up with more, but of course the Greens are opposing that too. When they tried to do the sonar scanning down the coastlines, to they blocked that. So basically anything that works, they block. If we find a lot of oil or gas, then we must use it, but the gas is going to take some years to A, detect that it's really there, and then get into production. It's not something you'll do in the next year. So the time scales are not much different to nuclear. Incidentally, mentioning that we can build a nuclear power station in South Africa in five or six years. The story about 10 to 12 and, and people like Mr. Milam and others, when the minister um, Ramahopa said 10, he was erring very much on, on that side. He, he's not right in that respect. But Kevin Milam even added a couple of years onto that. And the Greens add a few years onto that and push it to 15. They keep saying, well, it's bound to, it's bound to, it's bound to. Whereas they never say solar and wind projects are bound to go out of budget over time. But nuclear is always bound to go the wrong way. The, the, um, in the, the UAE, they've just now um, connecting their fourth nuclear reactor of, of a group of four to the electricity grid. It takes a while. You've got to synchronize it and do tests or whatever they're about to do the fourth way. There are 160 South Africans working on that plant that helped them build it. From cold start, never having had any nuclear before, in other words, all the legislation wasn't on their books, they had to do a whole lot of stuff during that time. They, in seven and a bit years, got their first reactor actually producing electricity from nothing, with 160 South Africans there were, and all the main positions. I mean, we can beat them. We have got a long nuclear history. We know what we're doing. If we get the money and people stay out of interfering with it by uh, all sorts of political interference and, and legal interference and so on. If they say to the engineers, here's the money, do it. We can have a large nuclear power station running in five or six years or maybe slightly longer, but certainly not 10. Um, these wind and solar take a couple of years. So we're talking about two or three years versus half a dozen for much more electricity, much more reliably. In Andre de Reiter's book, he goes into a lot of detail on how the last big projects uh, were massively, uh, there was massive corruption and there was uh, extreme cost overruns. And the public, for the public, it's very easy to believe that 
when you do have a big ticket item, given the history, especially with this government, that there will be massive cost overruns and in fact it'll be an opportunity to plunder. And we know the story of Hitachi. It's 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 well documented. How would that um, play with the argument of putting another big uh, a big ticket item in? You talk about six hundred and fifty billion uh, being the number that was spoken about there. Okay, bear in mind the six hundred fifty billion was to produce nine thousand six hundred megawatts, not the two thousand five hundred they're talking about now, but. Yes, you're quite right. But what happened, in fact, I spoke to Andre de Reiter face-to-face for an hour, and quite frankly, when I left that meeting, I was very unimpressed. He just was so closed-minded to a number of things I spoke about. I spoke about nuclear things. I said, look, you need to get the maintenance. This was over a year ago. And I said, the maintenance and the coal power stations is your single biggest issue. I can even help. I would colleagues that have been maintenance managers, and he said, no thanks, we're handling it all adequately in house. When he said that, I thought, good grief, you see. And that was the beginning of when everything started to go even more badly than before. So there was a lot of problems in Madupi and Kusili, for example, because of all the external interference. That was the issue. It wasn't anything wrong with the engineering concept and anything wrong with the South Africans. I know numbers of stories from South African engineering friends of mine who are on site, and they say, you won't believe that this happened and that happened. And all of them were things that the South African engineers wouldn't have allowed to happen had they been in charge in a normal engineering manner and didn't have somebody tell me, you've got to use those guys, the subproject, where you've got to bring foreigners in and you've got to do that, you've got to do that, all sorts of absolute interference all the way down the line. In the past, I can't remember the exact number, but when South Africa was building the, all the coal-fired power stations rapidly, we were building something like one entire coal-fired power station every year for something like half a dozen years at the same time as we were building Cecil and at the same time as we were building Richards Bay Harbour. And South African engineering did it. Um, you know, if you tell the South African engineers, look at the, the soccer stadiums, which there was that issue afterwards about the competition commission, with which I disagree. I don't think there was a competition problem. The engineering firms were told, get all those soccer stadiums operational by the World Cup. We did. When the IPL cricket, um, the first ever IPL cricket of India was due to take place in India, and there was all sorts of social unrest there, the Indians decided they couldn't run it in India. It was too risky. At, at short, short notice, they said to, as I recall, four months, they said to South Africa, can you do it? I remember watching the opening with a closing rather, and the boss from India said he couldn't believe how well the South Africans put on that first ever uh, Indian cricket in only four months from cold start. We did it on time and it was really well done. South African engineers are very good project managers. We have professional project managers here. Give them the job and leave them alone and stay out of the way and we'll do it. It's all the messing around that costs the money, not the professionalism of our engineers. And and I must admit that I get highly irritated when people are forever telling us nuclear professionals that we don't actually know what we're doing. You wouldn't go to South Africa's heart transplant surgeons, brain surgeons, and well, you guys don't actually know how to hold a scalpel properly. You don't actually know the difference between the aorta and the coronary artery, or you might interchange them by mistake. The number of people that say, but you know, you haven't thought of the regulatory processes. You haven't thought about the waste management. You haven't thought, we have, we spent millions of man hours doing it. We considered world authorities in this type of thing, you know. And Kubu, for example, is exceedingly well run, and yet every time you open a newspaper, somebody's saying the Kubu guys haven't thought of this, haven't thought of that. Haven't. They have, believe me. They know exactly what they are doing. They're doing a very good job. And just overall, South African nuclear people are consulted all over the world. People have huge respect for us. I found wherever I go around the world, people say, wow, well, this guy is a South African nuclear fellow. You, they know what they're doing. I've never found anybody who said, well, you only come from South Africa, therefore we've got to teach you. We know what we're doing. And so this constant projection to the public of sort of the incompetence of the South African nuclear fraternity is very wrong. And uh, so, you know, we must, we must go ahead with it. And it's the right thing to do. And everybody will bless the decisions in the future when they find that we are running with the cheapest electricity. And of course, when you work out this price, you do it like the bond on a house. You don't buy a house for one and a half million or two million or something, and then say, well, I've got to pay off the two million this year. You get a bond. 
That's exactly what you do with a nuclear build. You work it out. I can tell you from day one of the calculations of the small modular reactor, for example, of which we now have a world-leading model called the HTML 100 small modular reactor, which we want to build in Pretoria and which can be placed anywhere around the country. It does not need water cooling like the ocean. So you can put one in Secunda, and you can put one in Messina, if you like, and wherever. Right? We sat down, and the, the blank piece of paper on day one is the cost of the electricity must not exceed, exceed the cost of coal electricity now. And that was a design criterion from the beginning. And everything that was done, it was all resolved back. Is it going to cost more than coal power now? And if it was, they said, redo the calculations. And it's come out within that ballpark. So it's not many rands like people come up with all these little calculations on the back of an envelope, some accountants over a tea break or politicians over a tea break, and they come up with some fake numbers and they just project them. Nobody ever phones the nuclear people. You find statements are made on TV by political leaders or whatever, then I phone a dozen nuclear colleagues of mine say, did any of you get a phone call from so-and-so, so-and-so about the cost? No, not one. And yet all the cost experts in the nuclear field, one never consulted. They, they consult Greenpeace and Earth Life Africa and so on. So let's get real. You know, your program, Alec, is known for being real and sensible and people trust what comes through on your program. And I'm now appealing to people who watch this to have faith in the South African professionals. We trust our brain surgeons. We trust our orthopedic surgeons. We trust our so-and-so. Why don't you trust the nuclear professionals who also have put in all that study and all that experience and so on? And they poached by the all over the world. South African nuclear poached all over the world. I don't think anyone distrusts our nuclear uh, experts. They distrust the politicians. And what you've said today is that you distrust all politicians, not just on the one side of the house, but on the other side as well. In other words, uh, yeah, trust them, I suppose, but verify. And uh, you've helped us to verify things a lot better. Dr. Calvin Kem, who is a nuclear expert, he's the chairman of Astratic Global, and I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. 